Everybody's looking good. There is our reminder that we are recording this message. So uh, hopefully that's okay with you, Dan. We'll post it onto YouTube after for anybody and everybody to make sure they're able to see this. Uh, but let's get started. Uh, good morning or uh, early afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Bell. Um, I am the president elect of our club and Mr. Eric Weiler is on vacation with his family uh, celebrating spring break. And actually I am too. So you may see some children run behind me. Um, I'm in a hotel room in Miami. Um, they're, the kids are making their way either to the pool or to the beach. So if you see them scampering behind me, trying to hide, giggling probably, uh, that's the reason why I can't escape them right now. <laughs> um, but welcome everybody. We're gonna get started here with probably the crowd favorite uh, activity of these Zoom calls, but it, we like to call it Zoom Tips with Devin. And I'm gonna turn it over to Devin so he can educate us on anything and everything related to Zoom. Yes, uh, and there are a few things that I'll remind you of. Y'all know what's up. You have the reactions tab down at the bottom or over in your phone, it should be on the menu. You can raise your hand and use everyone's favorite emoji, the saxophone emoji or whatever your favorite is or the shamrock emoji, Tara Manettos with the most appropriate emoji for the day um, to add just a little life. But use that raise hand if you have questions, uh, if you have announcements later and then get in the chat if you wanna sign in for attendance or if you wanna chat with people, that's great. And then finally, I'll point out your view option. Uh, right now I've got it on gallery so I can see everybody's smiling faces. And you can also change it to speaker view. And then as our speaker presents, there should be a little slider in the middle of the screen. Hey, Swinkle Black, the lightning bolt emoji, that's a new one. Uh, there's a little slider in the middle of the screen where you can see more of the presentation or more of our presenter. And then do you want, Ryan, do you want to go to the um, Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, please. Yep, we'll get started with the Pledge of Allegiance, which I probably am doing a little bit out of order, but go ahead and take yourself off mute and uh, we'll all join in and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. The United, the United States, States of America, States of America. America. The flag. And, and, and to the, the Republic, Republic of the United States, for which it stands, one nation, which stands, and under God, 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 liberty, indivisible, and justice for all. For all. Beautiful. Excellent, everybody. Uh, well, we are going to jump right into introductions of any guests. I see some uh, fresh faces here on my screen, so I guess I would invite you, and people already got the uh, the cadence here. So Kelly Drown has a guest. I'm going to turn it over to her first. Great. Thank you, uh, President-elect Ryan. Um, happy to be here. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yes, my guest is Tommy Tigrick. He's on uh, the corporate and foundation relations team with me. So I will have you unmute your uh, microphone, Tommy, and you can in introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, this is my second time joining you all, and I can't say how much I enjoyed the first meeting I was able to attend about a month and a half ago. So thrilled to be spending the lunch hour with everyone. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy start of March Madness to everybody who is paying attention. Um, yeah, my name is Tommy Tigret. I am fortunate enough to work on Kelly's team in the Center for Advancement at the University of Iowa. Um, we are the Corporate and Foundation Relations team. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a native of the Quad Cities. I grew up in Bettendorf, uh, attended the University of Iowa, graduated in 2017 as an alum of the Sport and Rec Management Program. And we are fortunate to have Dan Matheson, one of the great mentors of many students here on the call today. Um, uh, let's see here. I spent about four and a half years working in the world of sports everywhere from the University of Kansas to a uh, Major League Baseball nonprofit in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, had the opportunity to sort of return to the university setting, um, work alongside other young professionals at St. Ambrose University, and then transitioned into this role at Iowa. Um, I can't say enough about the Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty community and the impact that it has had on my life. So thrilled to be back and to be joining everyone today. Excellent. Thank you, Tommy. Welcome. Uh, next up, I see Christy Felberg. Hi, everyone. I've got Kevin Warner, a colleague of mine uh, at Midwest One Bank. 
with us today. Um, and I told Kevin he could just smile and wave, but Tommy was a big overachiever. So Kevin, do you want to say any, any words? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Warner. I work at Midwest One Bank. I'll be at the bank 22 years in June. Uh, I'm an Iowa city -in, and my wife is a kindergarten teacher at Chimic, and she's going to retire in June. So that's something exciting. So it's nice to be here. Thanks, Christy. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. How about Amanda McFadden? Hi, everyone. Amanda McFadden, uh, visiting Rotarian from the Iowa City AM Club. Welcome once again, Amanda. We're always happy to have you here. And uh, all of our guests are always special, but we've got uh, Mariah Roller, who is a, who's going to take a little bit of time, two to three to four minutes here, to kind of tell us about some of her experiences um, leading up to growing a, a new understanding and appreciation for what Rotary is and what we do. So Mariah, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And hello, everybody. My name is Mariah Roller. Um, I'm here today because I reached out to Mr. Eric Wieland. Um, I was sponsored by your club actually in 2017 to attend the Rotary Youth Leadership Awards. Um, and I just wanted to reach out and thank you all and let you know what an important impact that has had on my life. Um, I know you don't always get to see the fruits of your labor and the things that you've contributed to. So I wanted to make it known to you all um, that Rilo is really, you know, my first introduction to a lot of the world really. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations were not something that I really had a lot of at my very rural school. Um, so following Ryla, I was really able to engage more critically with the world around me. Um, and it's led me to the path that I'm on today, which includes volunteering with um, the AmeriCorps VISTA program. So I'm in my third term of service with them and they're very closely aligned with, you know, Rotary and the idea of service to the community. Um, but I wouldn't be on that path today without your club specifically, but Rotary as a whole. So I wanted to thank you all and just, you know, champion the Ryla group um, and let you know that it's a very worthwhile program and they definitely appreciate your support. So thank you for having me today. Awesome, thank you for coming, Mariah. You're welcome anytime. And of course, as you know, you should join Rotary here at some point in your, in your young life and be a lifelong Rotarian because it's uh, something you'll get a lot out of. And, um, it's just awesome. We're a good group. We would love you in our club, but any club would be lucky to have you. So thanks Definitely. for joining us today. Thank you. Um, my AmeriCorps journey has actually brought me to Florida. So welcome to the state. Um, I'm down in Fort Myers on the other side of the coast, but something to look nice. at. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure there's a fine club over in Fort Myers. So how about Pete Wallace? You got an announcement or a guest? Well, I have an announcement. Um, it's a spontaneous one because nobody asked me to do it, but I spent a very pleasant 20 or 30 minutes with uh, uh, Christian Lepore this morning. She is the one who is in charge of the Iowa Most fundraiser that Weston City High School will be doing on April 4th. She was here, what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago to talk to us about this. This is the longstanding fundraiser that really does very well for supporting Iowa most. And it was a spontaneous thing from starting at West High. They just did it without telling us. And uh, Nancy Pesha, Jerry's uh, wife is, is the prime mover here and, and, and loved by everybody and helps out tremendously with it. But it's, it's, it's hard uh, to get uh, people to know about it and attend. So I am uh, urging you all to go to the Iowa Most website and there is a place that you can buy tickets and if you can't go that's fine buy tickets anyway and if you can't go and don't want to buy tickets make a donation to Iowa Most. It is April 4th it's coming up 6 30 at the CCPA in Coralville and it's always a lot of fun to see our high school kids and how talented they are but how eager they are uh, to help and to give and to get involved. So I urge you to do that. Just go to the website, it'll explain everything. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. And for those that don't know, Iowa Most is an awesome program uh, started here uh, in Iowa City by Rotary, but it, it does uh, cleft palate repair uh, surgeries. and. 
has changed a ton of lives for the better um, in and around Guatemala. So thank you for that announcement, Pete, and for all those that have uh, helped with that project over the years. So um, now is the time for other announcements. If anybody else has an announcement, please raise your hand um, and I'll call on you. I don't see any right now, so I'm going to tackle the ones that are on my plate to announce here. Um, first and foremost, we will be back in person April 7th. Um, so mark your calendar, plan to attend, plan to eat lunch at the Highlander and support them and just get back to uh, normal. We're going to sit down at random tables again and talk to each other and have, uh, you know, kind of spur of the moment conversations and just remember what probably brought us all into Rotary in the first place. So I, for one, can't wait to see you all in person and I hope you all are excited as well. Um, so that's April 7th at the Highlander. Um, we have, is Ron Ettinger here for a dictionary project announcement? Ron, I think I saw you sign in. He may pipe in here while he's uh, working on that. I'll make another quick plug, uh, two actually, one for the All Iowa Rotary District Conference coming up here in our backyard, Coralville, Iowa. April 22nd and 23rd. Um, there's a, a good list of speakers, um, entertainment. It's going to be a, a pretty good interactive experience. So I would encourage you all to attend and let's try to make a, you know, a good showing of local Rotarians supporting the All Iowa District Conference. Um, and then as you guys all probably know, April 16th, we are spearheading the planting of another hundred trees over in uh, Scott Park on the east side of town. The sign up has been available in the last couple of newsletters, but I'll get it into this one as well. And we will be starting at 10 a.m. Uh, come one, come all. It's not hard work unless you want it to be. Um, we need kind of everybody. We need people to take pictures, to transport trees, and then those that uh, want to get dirty and dig some holes. So uh, it'll be a great project. Again, it'll be the fourth time we've actually planted a whole bunch of trees and I know uh, I, for one, am excited about a beautiful spring day, much like I think you guys are having in Iowa City today. Um, I didn't mention to a lot of you, but I'm in Miami, so we are having a, a perfect spring day here. Uh, hopefully you all are too. And, um, any other announcements? Doesn't look like it. So look for those links in the newsletter and we've got a great program today. I know I'm really excited. I got a little bit of a preview uh, before we started the meeting, but I'm going to turn it over to Miss Barb Thomas to do our introduction today. Well, thanks very much, Ryan, and welcome everybody. Happy St. Patty's Day. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, Dan Matheson. So Dan is the director of the University of Iowa Sport and Recreation Management Program in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And in addition, he is an as associate professor of instruction. He also holds a complimentary appointment in Iowa's College of Law, where he teaches courses in sports law and baseball salary arbitration, which what an interesting time to think about baseball salary arbitration. Hmm. In 2017, he was named the Dean's Distinguished Lecturer in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. In 2016, he received the university's highest teaching honor, the President and Provost Award for Teaching Excellence. Dan recently completed a five-year term on Iowa's Presidential Committee on Athletics, which included two years as chair of the committee. Prior to joining Iowa's faculty, Dan worked as an NCAA Associate Director of Enforcement and as the New York Yankees Director of Baseball Operations. He has written more than a dozen articles on college athletics issues for collegead.com and sportslitigationalert.com and is frequently asked to provide expert insights during media coverage of sports industry news. His contributions have appeared in such media outlets as ESPN's Outside the Lines, in the New York Times, and on Sirius XM's College Sports Nation. Dan studied sports management as an undergraduate student at Iowa State University and went on to earn a law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School. He was raised in Iowa City, Iowa and returned home to join the Iowa faculty in 2011. 
In his teaching, Dan emphasizes experiential learning, which has led him to design practicum courses that have worked with the Chicago Blackhawks, NASCAR, Fox Sports, the San Diego Padres, the Iowa Wolves, and the Cedar Rapids Colonels, and to coach law students in mock baseball salary arbitration competitions. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, Dan Matheson. Dan, take it away. Thanks so much, Barb, uh, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to join everyone. Uh, just making sure first everybody can hear me okay. <clears throat> My audio is all right. Okay. I do have, <clears throat> excuse me. My voice is a little hoarse. I do have slides that I will uh, share with you here. So it's a uh, treat to see so many familiar faces here. Uh, Kevin, Christy, uh, Kelly, Tommy, uh, Barb, I really uh, uh, appreciate the, the hometown crowd, the, the friendly faces, but uh, great meeting uh, some new people in the breakout room and uh, hearing some of the different uh, backgrounds and uh, meeting some new people. I wish wish we could be in person, uh, but glad to hear that you will be getting back in person in a couple weeks uh, for more of those organic conversations that occur. When I uh, asked Barb, you know, what Rotary Club would be interested in hearing about uh, from me, I, you know, she suggested that uh, my background uh, in baseball and college athletics and maybe how that ties into my teaching here at the University of Iowa. And so uh, I, I themed my presentation here, as you can see, uh, teaching from life experience, uh, leaving Iowa City to go out, work in Major League Baseball, uh, with you know the most historic team in in baseball's history, and then uh, working for the NCAA, uh, one of the most notorious organizations in college sports these days, and uh, would be happy to talk about various issues there. But uh, really interested in talking about uh, you know how my experiences, uh, my, my professional experiences inform the classes that I teach and, and what I do now at the university. Uh, so I will uh, talk a little bit about my journey and uh, what, what my teaching role at Iowa involves, uh, both with the SRM program and the College of Law. <clears throat> College of Law has been more recent. I came back to join the SRM program in uh, 2011. And I started teaching at the College of Law uh, about four years ago. And uh, I really do wanna encourage anybody uh, to stop and ask me questions along the way. You don't have to wait until I've concluded. I really wanna make this as uh, back and forth and responsive to your questions as possible. So to start uh, talking a little bit about my journey, uh, it did begin here in Iowa City, but uh, I made for you know, what many around here consider an unfortunate decision to go to Iowa State. Uh, Iowa State at the time had a sport management program. Iowa did not. Uh, the, the tables have turned now. Iowa State no longer has that program. And of course, we have sport management here at Iowa. Uh, sport management was really in its infancy uh, as, as far as a, an area of study at colleges and universities across the country. Iowa State uh, cobbled together an early version of a sport management program. And so that gave me, uh, that really spoke to me because I, I went to West High School here in Iowa City. Uh, I loved sports. I was not a particularly good athlete. Uh, I played baseball 
And when I graduated from high school, that was the end of my competitive athletics career. So as I was thinking about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life as a career, I wanted to find a way to combine uh, my love of sports with uh, going to work every day. And obviously with that mindset, uh, something called sport management really spoke to me. And so I went off to Iowa State and uh, as uh, Barb indicated in her introduction, I did end up going on to law school at the University of Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that influenced me uh, to go to law school uh, along the way while I was uh, studying at Iowa State, I was fortunate to become the media relations intern for the Chicago Cubs in my junior year of college. And as you can imagine for a, a young person that uh, wanted to work in Major League Baseball, perhaps uh, grew up following the Cubs, this was a dream come true and great exposure to uh, what working in a Major League Baseball front office could be like. And one of the reasons that uh, that experience is, is important, uh, significant in my journey is uh, while I was there, I was starting to think about what I might want to do for uh, graduate school. And uh, I, I got to know and uh, developed a mentoring relationship with the general counsel for the Cubs at the time, Jeff Anderson. And he was a very gracious mentor, uh, very generous with his time, uh, answered all my questions about going to law, if I going to law school, if I wasn't sure that I wanted to practice traditional law, if I wanted to work in sports, you know, uh, is this degree for me? And with his encouragement, uh, because he, he convinced me uh, law school uh, teaches you how to think like a lawyer. You're not going to be pigeonholed into uh, uh, becoming a traditional attorney. Uh, the, the skills that you develop and sharpen in law school uh, are transferable to many different things that you'll do. And so uh, with his encouragement, I, I did finish my internship at the Cubs went back to do my senior year at Iowa State and, uh, and then enroll at Minnesota. And while I was at Minnesota, I, I uh, did non-traditional things. My, you know, my classmates were doing summer associate positions at law firms and, and I was interning for a minor league baseball team. And it was a very different experience, but it was the experience that I was going to law school for. And, uh, Ultimately, during my final semester of law school, uh, I was able to get a spring training internship with the Yankees. Uh, no promises of anything. I, I uh, went down there to work for one month uh, and it, the internship went exceptionally well and they uh, ended up making me a job offer uh, when that internship ended. So uh, that helped launch my career. I went back and finished my final exams in my last semester and then uh, actually moved to Tampa, Florida. So <clears throat> when I worked for the Yankees, I lived in Tampa, Florida the entire time uh, that I worked for them. Uh, first as an assistant in uh, baseball operations and then uh, becoming director of baseball operations. Uh, in, Flor in Tampa, the Yankees uh, had and still have a uh, year round player development and scouting facility. And I worked most directly with player development and scouting. Uh, we, were, we were all housed down there and, um, and, and that was where our owner uh, lived and worked every day. Uh, it was a very Florida-based organization, which most people don't realize. Um, spent six years with the Yankees, uh, and I'll, I'll briefly run through the rest of my journey before I uh, dive in a little bit 
more uh, specifically to my role at the Yankees and then my role at the NCAA. So I left the Yankees after the 2001 season as I was getting into my early 30s and, and looking for a little bit different, better work-life balance. Uh, and I found that at the NCAA, uh, used a very different side of my uh, legal training that I'll talk about in a moment there uh, in enforcement. Um, but then in my final few years at the NCAA, I actually had moved back to Iowa City uh, and worked for the NCAA remotely for uh, three years. And it was at a time when I was very interested in, in getting back to uh, my hometown and putting down more permanent roots here. And during that time uh, that I was living here and working for the NCAA, I was guest speaking in classes and uh, connected with the law school career services office to uh, mentor students in the law school that wanted to work in sports. And so through those experiences, I uh, became very interested at this stage of my career in uh, being involved full time in mentoring students and uh, uh, sharing my experiences, navigating this very competitive industry uh, to help other students out that want to follow a similar career path. Uh, so as I indicated before, a few years ago, I added teaching at the College of Law uh, to my repertoire. And, and uh, for anybody that wants to uh, connect outside of Rotary, I am quite active on social media uh, with my uh, professional endeavors for the university and elsewhere. And so uh, just to, to uh, dive a little bit deeper into uh, my time at the Yankees, I apologize that we are remote. Those four World Series rings that you see there, I would have brought them in person to lunch today if we had been dining together. But uh, I was very fortunate to be at the end. And, and I will say that Tommy here, uh, Kelly Drown's guest, uh, has had a chance to, to handle and try on those four World Series rings. So that's something that's become a tradition in my classes is show and tell on the last day of class, uh, which uh, most students don't know what I'm talking about when I say we're going to do show and tell. And uh, it, it takes them back to kindergarten days. But uh, while I was at the Yankees, obviously, uh, some of the highlights from my time there were winning the World Series in the uh, four times in the late 90s, we won in 96, 98, 99, and 2000, and working in baseball operations, it was, uh, you know, a dream come true. Uh, I did, uh, I was very fortunate that uh, I was there uh, during the time when Mr. Steinbrenner was still alive and uh, had a wonderful relationship with Mr. Steinbrenner, really had deep respect for him. And uh, he was a great influence on me and, and my professional development uh, at that stage of my career. Uh, he was very uh, hands-on, very active in our operations. Um, and for all of you Seinfeld fans out there, uh, he, he he did have some uh, striking uh, similarities to the character that uh, uh, Larry David played of uh, representing him on, on uh, the Seinfeld episodes. Uh, he was bombastic. Uh, he was uh, very demanding and opinionated, but uh, he was also extraordinarily loyal and uh, very uh, thoughtful in many ways, and uh, I love the man uh, and and have a lot of respect for what he did for for a lot of people uh, beyond just me. Uh, so, Mr. Steinbrenner uh, was an influential mentor, but I also was fortunate to work with 
and under other uh, very important mentors uh, at that time in my life, uh, uh, really accomplished people in the world of Major League Baseball uh, that were very generous with uh, their advice and their guidance and, and their support. And I know this this will make all of the non-Yankee fans out there vomit uh, to, to think about the Yankee way and, and how much I have internalized that. But, but when I, with that last bullet, the idea of, of uh, learning to live the Yankee way was just coming out of law school, uh, you know, law school in and of itself is it, it, enough of a intellectual challenge, a, a time demand challenge. Uh, uh, there's, there's so much thrown at you and, and you really go through incredible growth in three years of law school. And one would think that, you know, you're kind of a, a finished, fully formed product uh, coming out of law school and arriving at the Yankees, I just learned so much because uh, Mr. Steinbrenner uh, demanded perfection uh, in everything that we did and uh, always expected uh, that we would be the best in everything uh, compared to any of our competitors. And living every day, every hour under uh, those extreme demands just instilled a level of expectation in myself personally that has carried with me uh, far beyond my time with the Yankees. Obviously, when, when with the Yankees, uh, we had you know, Mr. Steinbrenner there uh, barking barking down our, our backsides to, to make sure that we were uh, the best that uh, we could possibly be. But uh, you can't help but uh, take that with you when, you when you choose to leave the organization. And so that, that really has become part of my DNA uh, is holding myself to standards that I don't think I ever would have uh, believed were possible. Uh, if I hadn't worked under such conditions at the Yankees. And, you know, my time at the Yankees, as incredible as it was, um, involved a lot of different duties. And I'll outline some of those there. So, you know, I talked about working in our player development and scouting uh, complex in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my role was to manage the off the field business side of our operations there. So that involved about 140 players under minor league contract uh, and managing the administration of their contracts, uh, serving as the liaison with our minor league general managers where we had those 140 different players dispersed around the country and, and around the world and our Latin American complex as well. Um, uh, I, another one of my roles was obviously we had have a lot of international players and those players all came into the United States on work visas. And uh, that was something that I managed. Um, we managed uh, minor league spring training out of our complex in Tampa uh, and I, oversaw the off the field side of uh, that process every March. Um, one of the, the things that, that certainly is considered one of the more exciting parts of the job was uh, being a part of a small group that, that would meet throughout the year whenever uh, player movement was was occurring or had the potential to occur, whether it was signing free agents or uh, making decisions about trades, uh, anything having to do with the New York roster, uh, we held all of our organizational meetings in Tampa. And uh, so being that, you know, they didn't need me to uh, tell them who the next Derek Jeter was, uh, but I managed the uh, off the field side of uh, 
those discussions so that our talent evaluators uh, could be could remain focused on uh, acquiring the next dare teeter on developing uh, players for the major leagues. Uh, I offloaded those responsibilities from our our uh, true talent evaluators. Uh, major League Baseball has a lot of rules that uh, involving player movement and, and roster composition and those were things that I was involved with as well. And so I, uh, in terms of utilizing my law degree, uh, it was very much transactional work, uh, writing contract language and, and uh, you know, dealing with uh, work visas and, and rules compliance, which was like uh, comparable to legislation. So uh, very transactional based work uh, that I, I bring up because I used a very different side of my law degree when I, when I went to the NCAA and I'll talk about that in a moment. So I spent six years at the Yankees and, and at the end of those six years, I was really, as I indicated before, starting to crave a better work-life balance. Uh, my life was extraordinarily unbalanced at the Yankees. I, I worked about 355 days a year for six years straight. Uh, there, you didn't take weekends, you didn't take holidays, uh, you worked all the time. And, and that was not considered overachieving. That was, uh, that's part of the lifestyle. And, you know, that, that while the Yankees certainly did it to another level, uh, that when you go down a player personnel route in professional sports, you're pretty much signing up for uh, that lifestyle. It's a very uh, all-encompassing, uh, defining career. And, and there are other aspects of my personality that I recognized were never going to be fed uh, uh, through that lifestyle for, for the rest of my life. I wanted to pursue other interests and hobbies and and that's what led me to uh, walk away from the Yankees and uh, transition to the NCAA. Um, so at the NCAA, uh, I was involved in enforcement of the NCAA rules. And those rules primarily had to do with recruiting violations and academic fraud violations. Uh, of a major variety. There were two different divisions in enforcement, major and secondary. Uh, I was among the investigators that worked on the major uh, violation side. Uh, this was utilizing uh, the advocacy side of my law degree. Uh, you know, the, the NCA was essentially my client. The NCAA infraction process is very much like an administrative law hearing uh, or an administrative law proceeding. And so uh, in this role, I would conduct uh, interviews that aren't quite as formal as, as uh, depositions, but certainly have that feel of uh, somewhat adversarial uh, interviews at times uh, and gathering documentation for review of evidence and uh, analyzing uh, whether alleged violations occurred. And if violations did occur, uh, drafting uh, allegations against a school, against a coach, and then building a case through the evidence that you collect through your investigation, through your interviews that you conduct, through uh, your document reviews, and then ultimately uh, presenting that case uh, to the NCAA Committee on Infractions, uh, where uh, typically a school and a lawyer, a school and a coach would be represented by uh, attorneys. Uh, and, and during that process, uh, the Committee on Infractions members would uh, question 
all parties in the room and, and those hearings would go on all day, um, making arguments, uh, responding to counter arguments from uh, opposing counsel and uh, so forth until the uh, committee has all the information that it needs to go back and deliberate and make decisions about penalties. I spent nine years at the NCAA doing this, and I, I really enjoyed uh, my experience at the NCAA. Uh, I, I love the people that I worked with. Uh, I did find the work-life balance that I was seeking uh, in my early 30s. And, uh, and it was a, a uh, certainly a, a different side of the industry. And uh, you, you really, in, in a lot of ways, saw the underbelly of college athletics and, and uh, some really unsavory uh, behavior uh, by people uh, that should know better, should should uh, be responsible role models in the college athletic system. Uh, but it, it was, uh, while I enjoyed doing it very much uh, for nine years, as I was getting to the end of my time with the NCAA, like I said, I was starting to, to mentor students at the University of Iowa. I was uh, spending more time connecting with young people that wanted to break into the business and recognizing that after 15 years between Major League Baseball and the NCAA, I had a lot of acquired experience that could be of great value to people that were in the same position I was uh, 15 to 20 years earlier trying to figure out how I was going to break into the industry, where I fit, what my interests were, and how I was gonna combine my love of sports with what I was gonna do for a living for the rest of my life. And so that brought me to the University of Iowa. Uh, uh, I, my, not surprisingly, uh, my teaching philosophy uh, revolves around structuring uh, realistic experiences for students to learn from, putting students into settings where they have to respond like the pros and uh, get experience uh, managing, you know, problem solving, uh, managing clients, uh, working with real world issues. Uh, as Barb indicated in her introduction, I've designed a lot of uh, uh, hands-on experiential learning courses with organizations like the Chicago Blackhawks and the Sea Rapids Colonels. I do a summer uh, practicum course. This summer will be the ninth year that I've worked with the Blackhawks and Colonels. And we have several alumni from uh, that summer practicum experience who now work full-time for the Blackhawks. Uh, in fact, last summer, uh, our students finished their final presentations and within a week, one of the young women who had, had been part of that practicum experience was hired by the Blackhawks. Uh, she was graduating at the end of that class and uh, the Blackhawks had an opportunity that she was perfect for. So she started working there right away after the practicum. And there are a lot of great stories like that and a lot of alumni who have leveraged that experience to go on to ESPN and uh, other uh, amazing careers uh, in throughout the, the sports landscape. Uh, NASCAR and Fox Sports is a really cool practicum that I developed a couple of years ago with a friend of mine at NASCAR and uh, students in that prod, in that experience have worked uh, to, to design uh, promotional campaigns that would attract Gen Z young college age viewers to watch the Daytona 500 broadcast on Fox Sports. And the students have designed some really creative strategies that uh, the executives at NASCAR and Fox Sports have 
uh, really been blown away by. And with all of these experiences, uh, the one of the most gratifying things is to see an organization activate a student recommendation. Uh, the students develop, uh, they, they do a ton of research, market research and, and uh, uh, designing of, of new and different approaches. And it, it has led to some really uh, innovative solutions for organization partner problems uh, that they've been facing. Uh, and then I've expanded my experiential teaching into the College of Law. All the courses that I teach in the College of Law are for experience credit, which uh, the ABA requires. And uh, the baseball salary arbitration, uh, that it is a fascinating time, Barb, to, to be teaching a class like that. Uh, in fact, in my sports law class this semester, the first project my students did was to negotiate a new Major League Baseball collective bargaining agreement. So they beat the owners and the players to the punch and uh, got that, the process over with much more quickly uh, than the real world scenario. Um, the, the NCA infractions process is actually a new course that I just developed and I'm gonna start teaching this fall and that's going to involve a uh, competition here on campus uh, in the spring semester that will bring teams from around the country uh, to compete. It, think of it as a uh, moot court, but based around an NCAA infractions case. So giving sports law minded students a topic that they're going to be really excited about uh, preparing for and all the while developing their uh, advocacy skills and client representation skills. And I know that we're, uh, I, I, please tell me, I, I have a feeling we're running a little bit low on time. Um, yeah, do we want to jump into a question or two here, Dan, or? Yeah, wanna... please. Uh, yeah, I have a, just a couple of slides at the end here where if you're interested in, in reading more about uh, some of these projects that students have had a chance to work in in some of my classes, uh, these, these are stories uh, that have appeared on campus here at the university that do a great job capturing uh, what, what some of these experiences are like. But yeah, please, cool. questions, ask away. Yeah, if we, we don't have a whole lot of time, we just have, have a couple minutes, but is there any burning questions anybody would like to get off their chest for Dan? I'll take one. Okay, Dan, do you pick a bracket for the men's or women's tournaments? And if you do, who'd you pick? <laughs> uh, yeah. My wife and I just have a friendly in-house competition. Uh, we each have our brackets and I have Villanova winning the tournament. If facing Kentucky in the final and winning the tournament. I, I'm, I'm certain that I'll be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the perfect bracket to me, except, you know, I think a lot of us would hope the Hawkeyes make it to that championship game, but uh... Thank you very much, Dan. That's really interesting. I guess, you know, guys, follow him on Twitter um, or we can get his email too for any other additional questions. But um, we appreciate your time, Dan. Uh, as part of Rotary, what we'll do uh, in honor of your time is we donate 70 polio vaccinations um, around the world to complete and, and finally end the, uh, the terror of polio on our, on our world. So Thank you very much for your time. That was great. Um, we're gonna end this meeting the way we always do. And if Devin could pull up the four-way test, we will uh, have everybody unmute yourself. We're gonna say go Hawks before we say the four-way test, big game this afternoon. Um, but of the things we think, Thank say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? 
Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Go Hawks. Thank you very much, everybody. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Have a great week. We'll see you right here next week. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.